Ms. Jailalita, thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for meeting me. It's great to see you uh, once again after election victory. So first of all, congratulations on sweeping Tamil Nadu. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to see you too. Uh, Ms. Jailalita, <coughs> did you uh, expect such a large and sweeping statement from the people of Tamil Nadu in the last elections? I did expect it. I wasn't surprised at all by the results. In fact, throughout my election campaign, I was interacting with the media persons almost uh, every day. Whenever they asked me what the results would be like, I told them that our alliance would get not less than 200 seats. And we did get 203. Well, that's quite incredible. Uh, Mijelita, I've always found that you've been very forthright and direct. And uh, when you spoke to me last on the 11th of November 2010, uh, you made a dramatic offer uh, and you said that if required, the AIDMK was willing to support the center. May I ask you, ma'am, the circumstances and the context in which you made that extremely important statement and how you look back on it? In November 2010, the entire political situation was different. At that time, the center had not yet taken any action against those involved in the 2G spectrum scam. Though the nation was expecting the center to take some action, no action was taken. So at that time, there was a feeling that perhaps the center was hesitating due to the compulsions of coalition politics. That was why I made that offer so that the Congress could feel assured that they would not have to suffer in case the DMK withdrew its support to the UPA government at the center. It was in that context that I made that offer so that the Congress which was heading the coalition government at the center could feel reassured that even if it did take strong action against corruption, the government would not suffer, the government would not fall because of such action, and they could continue. It was to give them that reassurance and confidence that I made that offer. But then after that, the situation has totally changed. After that, the Congress has made it very clear that it continues to have an alliance with the DMK, and it did face the assembly elections in Tamil Nadu after that in alliance with the DMK. And even after the results of the elections were known, after the DMK suffered a massive uh, defeat, the Congress has uh, continued to assert that it still has an alliance with the DMK. And till today, the DMK continues to be a part of the central government, it continues to be an important constituent of the coalition government at the center. So Ms. Jalalitha, why do you think they were cool to your offer at that point of time? Because it was a very explicit offer. In fact, you even put out the number and you said to me, the Congress does not want to lose the support of those 18 MPs, but now, and I'm quoting you, the DMK's position has become untenable, Raja's position has become untenable. Raja eventually went three days later. My question to you is, Ms. Jalalita, why were they cool to you? And do you think you set the ball rolling for Raja's ouster with your offer to the Congress? That's what the entire nation said and felt. But as to why the Congress did not take up my offer then, I think that is a question you should put to the Congress. As far as I am concerned, that is all history. Now it's in the past. Today it's a totally different scenario a totally different situation in politics today. That situation does not exist now. But don't you think political alliances, Ms. Jailalitha, Congress leaders have said, and I'm quoting them, that the relationship with the DMK and the case against Mr. Raja are not related issues. That's how they've been trying to position it. But that's not the way the nation sees it. That's not the way the people see it. My question again, I'm going to be a little persistent on this. Um, 
I can't quite fathom why they said no to you. I, I want to see how you look at it. Because the relationship with the DMK obviously did not work electorally. They had a standing offer from you. And yet they didn't take up your offer, acted against Raja. So it's a bit of a piecemeal approach, isn't it? You used the words standing offer. It yes. wasn't a standing offer. It was a one-time offer made in November 2001. It's not a standing offer. I, and I, I repeat, as to why the Congress did not take up that offer, they are the best judges and they should answer your question. As far as I am concerned, I made that offer in a particular context, in a particular situation. Today, that situation has drastically changed. It doesn't exist anymore. And as far as I am concerned, as far as my party is concerned, it's all in the past. May I contest that? Because the issue, is it really over? There have been details which have come out recently in the case of another cabinet minister, uh, Mr. Dhani Dimara. Elaborate details have come out. You may have seen some of it reported on our channel as well of the Aircel Maxis deal. Uh, there are large investments which have been made, parallel investments which have I been made. I gather you are referring to Mr. Dayani Dimara. Yes. I have myself demanded uh, his ooster from the cabinet. To get back to your question, your question seems to be this. When one after the other, DMK bigwigs and ministers are involved in corruption cases, why is the Congress still persisting in an alliance with the DMK? Is that your question? Precisely. Well, I would think that uh, the Congress should answer this question. It's a question you should put to the Congress. In fact, not just you. The entire nation perhaps is wondering why. When so many DMK ministers and leaders are involved in such large-scale corruption, why is the Congress persisting in its alliance with the DMK? That's a question that the Congress should answer. How can I answer for them? I completely understand. But obviously there's an element of political expediency. I want to question you once again on Mr. Dayani Dimaran because I want to know in detail, and I know you spoke about in your 14 June news conference in Delhi, but the colossal amount of evidence that exists Ms. Jailalita. There's a Shiv Justice Shivaraj Patil report. There are corporate statements of the Maxis company. There are annual prospectus before the stock markets of Sun TV, which show an intent to invest in telecom. There's a serious question of conflict of interest. Ms. Jailalita, who should be taking action, if at all? The CBI. The CBI should take action. Politically? Politically, it has to be ordered by the Prime Minister. Action should be ordered by the Prime Minister. It should be taken by the CBI. In several of these cases, the action has not yet come from the Prime Minister. Ms. Jalita, I'm sure you've, uh, you noted that. Well, even in uh, Mr. Raja's case, the action was quite delayed. Even in Ms. Kanimuri's case, the action was quite delayed. And in Mr. Dayanedi Maran's case, perhaps it's just a case of delayed action. Maybe action will be taken in a few days' time. We have to wait and see. Uh, is it in your view there is talk that Mr. Dayanedi Maran may be asked to move out in a cabinet reshuffle? In your view, Ms. Jailalita, if one is sending a statement against corruption, is being moved out in a cabinet reshuffle the same as being asked to go or being sent out in the manner in which Mr. A. Raja was. If this is a question that should be put to the Prime Minister. I don't think I can answer on behalf of the Prime Minister. He should answer this. At several times, even in my last interview with 11th November, you spoke about the Prime Minister in your last news conference, you spoke about the Prime Minister, and you did say that the Prime Minister obviously will act on it, it is the responsibility of the Prime Minister, etc. Let me candidly ask you, Ms. Jalant, how do you view the Prime Minister, the role of the Prime Minister, the role of the Prime Minister's office in all these recent scams which have erupted? And how do you view it in, in the context of the ongoing debate? You are expecting some sensational statements from me, perhaps. Being bold, being courageous is one thing. Being pragmatic and wise when you are leading a state is another thing. And what I feel personally may not necessarily be what I say as the Chief Minister because I have a responsibility to do what is good for my state. 
Our state is in difficulties because of the maladministration of the former government. So we need all the assistance we can get from the center. I will only say that it is the duty of the Prime Minister to take action against corrupt members of his cabinet, of his council of ministers, and the entire nation expects that the Prime Minister will act decisively. Ms. Jalalitha, in your last news conference in Delhi, you almost stumped everyone with your comment on the Home Minister, Mr. Chidambaram. Why did you talk in detail about Mr. Chidambaram after some time, Ms. Jalalitha? It was not expected. It stumped a lot of people. I'm sure it stumped Mr. Chidambaram himself. And uh, I don't know if you've seen his response. He did say, that Ms. Jailalta always begins on the wrong foot and went on to say the matter is sub -judice. I'd like to have your response to the way in which Mr. Chidambaram has responded to this issue and what you think of it all. I'll take your question in parts. Yes, ma'am. First about uh, Mr. Chidambaram's comment about my always starting on the wrong foot. The entire nation feels I've started very well in this uh, third term of office as Chief Minister. Everyone feels I've started very well. I feel the same myself. And as for stumping everyone, I hadn't planned to say anything about the Home Minister or Mr. Chidambaram. I was asked a specific question. So I responded to that question. It is a fact that we are the aggrieved party. It is a fact that my candidate was declared the winner when the Lok Sabha election from the Shivaganga constituency took place in 2009. He was declared the winner. It was announced on some television channels also. In fact, Mr. Chidambaram went out of the office where the votes were being counted, went out of the counting center, and he gave an interview there on the spot to some television channels, to some media persons, and he himself went on record saying the people had rejected him, and he was conceding victory to the AIADMK candidate, that he had been defeated. After that, something happened. We can only speculate. Apparently, someone approached Mr. Arahiri, and Mr. Arahiri spoke to his father, the then Chief Minister. And after that, instructions were given to the collector, who was the returning officer, to order a recount. And so all of a sudden, the collector barged in, into the counting center, and asked how the results could be announced in his absence, and demanded a recount. And so when one particular segment was taken up for recounting, that is the Alangudi assembly segment, They made use of the data entry operator who was feeding the data into the computer to register fraudulent results. To be very plain and explicit, when the votes were counted manually, they were entered by hand. And that paper was shown to my candidate and his agents, and they signed on that paper in good faith. Then this was given to the data entry operator to be fed into the computer. While feeding the data into the computer, what the operator did, data entry operator did, was to transfer the votes won by my candidate to Mr. Chidambaram, and to transfer the votes got by Mr. Chidambaram to my candidate, so that the total remained the same. But Mr. Chidambaram won by a slender margin of about 3,000 to 4,000 votes. This was how a fraudulent victory was registered. So my candidate has filed a case in the Madras High Court, the High Court of Madras. The case is going on. And as for contempt of court, it is not contempt of court at all because it can be construed as contempt of court only if you say, or say something that is derogatory about the judge or the functioning of the court. But I have not said anything like that. I only stated the facts and 
This evidence is there for all to see. It's been placed before the court. It's not the first time that I'm making this statement either. Though probably it came to the attention of the national media only in Delhi. Even when counting was being taken up for the assembly elections here in Tamil Nadu, I sent a letter to the chief electoral officer of Tamil Nadu alerting him to what had happened in Sivagangai and asking him to ensure that the same fraud was not repeated by the data entry operators in all the 234 constituencies in Tamil Nadu. And the Election Commission of India took it seriously and they ensured that the data entry operators were neutral persons sure. who were brought from banks and income tax offices and other such neutral places. And that was how we were able to get a genuine result. I would like to repeat that Mr. Chidambaram has played a fraud on the nation and his position as Union Home Minister is untenable. 